I am Sean Webb, and this is your Superior Self. Hi, this is Rock Goddess, and I am rolling with your Superior Self. Hi, this is Dave Meltzer, and this is your Superior Self. Hi, this is Zach Poitra, and this is your Superior Self. I'm Jeannie Sarasvati, and this is your Superior Self. What's up, everybody? I'm Aubrey Marcus, and this is your Superior Self. What is up, Superior Nation? I'm Trey Downs, and this is Your Superior Self. And today we get to talk about happiness and the chemicals that are associated with that that are produced from your brain to your body. Now, there's a ton of chemicals that are produced in your body. However, we're going to talk about just a couple, a couple basics to catch you up on the main uh, chemicals that I talk about majority of the episodes because they make me feel good. They make me feel rewarded. They make me feel invincible. And then we're going to talk about the one that makes you feel stressful and anxiety. But before we do, and before I get into that, uh, I got all of this great information from Loretta, Dr. Loretta Bruning's book titled Habits of a Happy Brain. And the reason why I like this book and why I learned so much from it, it is, it is broken down in a very, very basic type of way. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a expert in neuroscience or biology. And so I need help when it comes to reading these books. And this book is formatted in a way that I can totally easily understand the process of what the brain does and the functions of the different types of brain parts um, and what chemicals they produce. So we talk about dopamine. And that's the motivational drug, or not the motivational drug, the motivational chemical that is produced from your brain uh, that motivates you to get what you want and get what you need. Now, endorphins, which is my favorite, is what I feel after I get done running. It's that chemical that is produced so that you can ignore your ignore your pain. So when you're running from that animal back in the day when we, our ancestors were running from lions and tigers and bears, if they got caught up on something, if they sliced open their arm or their legs got caught and I don't know, uh, uh, they tripped over something and they needed to get up fast and get out of the way, the endorphins would mask that pain and allow them to get away and, and into safety or into a safer place. Now, oxytocin is what motivates you to trust others. And that helps you find safety in companionship. So oxytocin, mm -hmm. it's that uh, feel good drug when you're with your significant other and uh, serotonin, which motivates you to get respect, which expands your mating opportunities and protects your offspring. And then we also talk about cortisol, which is that uh, anxiety. Uh, type of chemical that is produced when you're in very stressful situations and we have an amazing conversation and I want to play a little clip for you uh, just to give you a little preview of what Loretta has to say. This constant comparing is natural and we make it worse by filling our lives with messages of other people comparing I know everyone blames social media for that, but it was around long before. And so here we are comparing, comparing, and then we think, well, maybe other people are getting more of these good feelings more easily than I am. And that's part of the medical model that, which I think has hurt people. It creates the idea that other people are getting happy chemicals for free, just from sitting around and something must be wrong with me. So the medical system can fix it. And that's why I like the animal perspective so much because it shows that our happy chemicals were not designed to be released for no reason, that they're only designed to be released when they help us meet a need. And I really like Dr. Bruning's take on the animalistic model because it breaks it down for me who, you know, I'm a bro, you know, like I am almost an animal. Uh, so it, it helps me understand the reasoning behind the chemicals that are produced and why they create happiness or why they create stress. And I can look at the practices that she has in the book, the little workbooks uh, or little examples um, that she has you participate in during the book while you're reading in the different chapters to kind of change my habits so that I can produce new neural pathways, new neural circuits and create more chemicals, more dopamine, more uh, endorphins and less cortisol. And for those who have read this book, let me know. I want to know what your thoughts are. You can message me 
at yoursuperiorself.com. You can follow me on Instagram at tdowns80 and on Twitter at downstray. You can message me on those social media platforms. Let me know your thoughts on the whole changing your habits or what you've done to change your habits to produce more happy chemicals because it is it is as simple as that. You can 100% change your habits to change the chemicals that are produced in your body to help you feel more happy, more respected, more inspired, or motivated. 100%. And I hope that you guys understand that. It doesn't Regardless of age, you can create better neural pathways. You can create more I don't, you know, I always had this myth that you couldn't create more brain cells at a certain point, and it's not true at all. It's called neurogenesis, and you can create, um, every day you're creating more brain cells in your in your brain to help create better neurological pathways. So, yeah, I'm excited. I love talking about this type of stuff because I'm not a master at neuroscience. I'm not a master at, at, at this, but it's interesting because having... Dr. Bruning on here has helped me understand it better, and I hope it does that for you. You guys, I'm excited. And if you want to find out more about Dr. Bruning, you can go to www.intermammalinstitute.org, and she has some great content and and valuable um, uh, information over there that can help you deal with anxiety, that can help you with addiction. Um, There's some great um, information for parents and teachers. I think she also has a podcast. Yeah, for sure. She definitely has a podcast. <laughs> Looking at it right now. She has a podcast. Great information. I mean, I love this stuff. Um, so yeah, without further ado, here is my conversation with Doc. Hi, I'm Loretta Bruning, and this is Your Superior Self. Loretta, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to have a chat with me today about happiness. It's nice to be here. Thanks for doing it. Yeah. Uh, so I got your book. I read it and immediately had to reach out and I wanted to you know, set up an interview with you on the podcast because I believe so many people, obviously, we put a lot of stock in happiness. Um, we're always chasing it. We never know how to, how to keep a hold of it. And your book does a great job of breaking it down in its basics. So before we get into your book titled Habits of a Happy Brain, why don't you go ahead and give everybody a, you know, some background on you. Sure. Uh, Well, I was a college professor for 25 years. I was able to take early retirement when I reached that point of frustration that I think most people can imagine after 25 years of anything. And I was able to spend more time doing my own research and um, trusting my own uh, insights rather than feeling um, pressured by a certain academic paradigm. And also a lot of time sampling different theories and approaches to wellness. And um, that's when I stumbled on this idea of the brain chemicals that make us feel good are inherited from earlier animals. And the job that they do in animals is so obviously similar to our daily lives. And when I say stumbled on this this idea, I mean, it was my idea. Nobody else wrote about this, but I just stumbled on the little pieces and put them together. Well, how do you stumble upon that? Like, was there a moment in your life where you were like, aha, like this makes sense? You know, I did try to sort of trace that down. Um, So a lot of it revolves around monkeys. So I think, well, how did I get into the monkey thing? So I connected the dots between my first class in my freshman year of college, my first morning, like I I had this psychology class and it was one of these classes in those days, there were like a thousand people in the class. And so it was in a big auditorium and it was before PowerPoint, but because it was a thousand people, it was this giant like, like a movie theater. So there was a picture of a monkey that involved in some experiment. And I so clearly remember that monkey on like, imagine like a whole movie theater screen or bigger with these monkey experiments. So then on the other side of it, it was right after 9-11 when I was upset like other people and trying to understand behavior. And I stumbled on this book called chimpanzee politics. And the way I stumbled on it, I literally went into Amazon and put the word chimpanzee and politics 
without knowing that there was a book called Chimpanzee Politics. And so those are two big turning points for me. That's interesting. It's crazy. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and, and, and so there's four basic chemicals in your brain, right? Uh, serotonin, dopamine, well, I guess there's more than four, but oxytocin and, and endorphins. And then the, the bad stuff, the stuff that uh, makes us feel bad is actually cortisol. Um, can you explain each of those and what they do? Sure. Uh, so anyone who's into biology knows there's like hundreds of chemicals, but these are the ones that um, create good feelings, that it's just about good feelings rather than many associated things. And cortisol is the main bad feeling, although there's all other components that mm -hmm. people like to bring up. So the four good feelings that I focus on um, uh, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, endorphin. So you want me to introduce basically each one? Yeah, please. Okay. So dopamine is the good feeling that you're about to get a reward. And the way a reward has been defined for most of like the past millions mm -hmm. of years that our brain evolved is that our ancestors didn't have a refrigerator or a supermarket. They didn't know where their next meal was coming from. So they always had to find food. And as soon as they found it, and it was eaten and it was gone and they had to find more. So we evolved a brain that motivates us to seek. And when you're hungry, you're like, oh, I look around for something good. And then it's like, oh, there's something. And dopamine turns on, it gives you a good feeling and you wanna to move toward whatever stimulated it before. And because in the modern world, it's easier to fill your belly so you can manage to think of something other than food some of the time. And then we have other things that we seek and find. And it's all based on whatever triggered your dopamine in your unique individual past. Then whenever you're like, oh, you sort of have a gap and you're like, what can I do to feel good? Then you look for things that stimulated your dopamine before and the excitement starts. So dopamine's like that reward. Like if I'm, you know, I want to do, uh, I, I want to get that quick hit, right? Like that. I, I did something great. There's a dopamine. That's the reward. Mm, um, I wouldn't exactly say that because I did something great as serotonin. So mm -hmm. we can, you know, dopamine is like, I'm going to get something great if I take action. Serotonin. I, I thought that was like the, acceptance right or the the oxytocin oxytocin is acceptance. is is acceptance so that's the one that's related to the group so that's the one that you feel good when you are what's the one re respect is that serotonin yeah. yeah yeah okay respect serotonin my favorite is uh the endorphins I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm an endorphin addict i am uh, really Exercise, you like exercise. exercise? Well, I run quite a bit, like that runner's yeah. high. Like I have to have it. Like I, I feel like I get into a, a lot of flow states, right? Um, uh, you know, with the mind, uh, you know, changing frequencies, you know, bounce, balancing upon that, what is it, the uh, alpha theta line and being able to have creative ideas and be very creative about the podcast and stuff like oh, that. While you're running? Yeah, while I'm running. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I'm going to ask my husband about that. I don't think he has it. Okay. Good, good. Um, but I mean, yeah, I, I have a lot of like insight when I'm running. Like, because I run like, yeah, 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 yeah. like four to six miles or something like that. So I, I, I try to, and I, at first it sucks. Like, it, you know, definitely cortisol, right? Like, I feel like, you know, the, the, the pressure of how many miles am I going to knock out today? Like that kind of lingers around. And if I don't get my goal, then obviously I feel, you know, like I haven't achieved something great for the day and, and starting it that way, but it's, it's tough to run long, long distances. So it's like, and now that I run more like the, the level or the, the, my goal has to, I keep pushing my goal up. So if I want to run, you know, I, <laughs> I can't just run one mile and feel that endorphin level. Like I have to run like six to get to where most people feel at one. But I think, um, you know, the, the ideas that you present in this book are fantastic, how they're very basic, um, how you relate them to, I guess, like us when we were hunters and gatherers, it makes a lot more sense, I guess, because like, um, like you it's had said. It's about the nonverbal part of the brain. Mm -hmm. 
So mm -hmm. we have our verbal cortex and then we have the brain structures that we inherited from earlier animals. And they don't talk to us in words, so, uh, that part of the brain. So that's what controls the chemicals. And when the chemicals turn on and off, they don't tell you the reason. So that's why understanding the reason in animals helps us make sense of it all. Now in animals, what does endorphin do? Uh, the exercise that you talked about. Well, um, it's, and you know, it's endorphin is morphine, which is opioid, heroin, whatever. So why would the brain naturally make that? Because in the animal world, when you're injured, you need to mask pain for a few minutes in order to run to save yourself. So um, you may see in a nature video that an animal is attacked and its flesh is ripped open, but it could still run because endorphin masks pain and that's its job. So our brain is not designed to make us feel high and endorphin high only lasts for a short time when you have physical pain. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I get it because like, you know, you think about it with the running again, like I feel pain, like I feel I have aches and pains. My body is trying to, you know, maybe after 30 minutes or so, like my body will inject, not, not inject, but my brain will, will release. release more yeah, endorphins yeah. and then that will mask that pain. And then I'll feel high, as you say. But I mean, you also explain, I think you explain like what each relates to is, I think didn't you say like dope means like cocaine or something like that. Did you put that in here or yes. am I thinking about yes. something else? Yes, uh, it is. Dopamine's like cocaine. Endorphins are like heroin. Uh, the, what about opioid. oxytocin? Yeah. Opioids. What is oxytocin, oxytocin and serotonin? Okay, serotonin is antidepressant. Mm -hmm. um, it's like the close equivalent. Oxytocin, a couple of things. You could say ecstasy, although ecstasy, I understand, has a number of these. And I, first I have to say, I'm really not advocating this. Absolutely not. So I may have to repeat that like often, but um, oxytocin is also orgasm. And it's also for people who are biology fans, I have to add is lactation in mothers. Mm. Um, now I, I find myself in that group that I might be ADHD or something like that, where my, um, do, it takes a lot more dopamine for me to feel rewarded um, for whatever reason. So that's why I'm always like looking, I get bored very easily. Like I, I feel like, you know, my, my goals or whatever might be a little bit more extreme than most because I don't feel the simple dopamine that people, I feel like people feel when they, when they achieve something. Can you, can you explain that? Like, do you sure. have any insight on that? Yeah. So the way I always exp explain it, let's say you're a monkey and you wake up hungry in the morning and you see some fruit in the distance. So as soon as you see the fruit, then dopamine like, oh, there's something I can get. So the good feeling of dopamine starts when you see something that will need a need, number one, and that you believe you can get it, number two. So once the dopamine starts, that motivates you to take a step toward it. And when you see that you get a step closer, it's like, yeah, it's still, you know, it's within reach if I keep going. So that motivates you to take another step and another and another. So we wire ourselves to release dopamine when we take small steps. So when you're running, you've learned because you expect to feel good when you have achieved whatever um, running goal you've set, you are willing to take all those small steps. But when it comes to certain other aspects of life, you may not have learned to expect to get the banana. So therefore, you're not so motivated to take the little steps. So that's sort of a challenge for all of us. So we all had our expectations wired from early experience. So one person, you could say, like is a math junkie, and they expect to feel good when they do math. And like other people think, what are you, crazy? But then they expect to feel bad if they like ask someone for a date. But other people love to ask someone for a date and hate to do math. So it's the expectation that I'm going to get the banana that starts the dopamine flowing that makes me willing to take a step, which then makes me willing to take another step if the first step worked. Mm. So do, is, does everybody essentially have like the same baseline of chemicals? Do some people experience some chemicals more than others? 
I don't know. I really discourage this whole idea of comparing ourselves to others. And ironically, then the next chapter explains that you can't stop yourself from comparing yourself to others because monkeys compare themselves to each other constantly because that's how, like when a monkey gets the one up position, that's when its serotonin is released mm. and it feels what we would call in human terms, pride. And if it's in the one down position, then it loses pride. So it's always looking to be in the one up position. But if you push too much, then you get bitten by a bigger monkey. So they're always comparing themselves to others and being really careful. And so this constant comparing is natural and we make it worse by filling our lives with messages of other people comparing. I know everyone blames social media for that, but it was around long before. And so here we are comparing, comparing, and then we think, well, maybe other people are getting more of these good feelings more easily than I am. And that's part of the medical model that, which I think has hurt people. It creates the idea that other people are getting happy chemicals for free just from sitting around and something must be wrong with me. So the medical system can fix it. And that's why I like the animal perspective so much because it shows that our happy chemicals were not designed to be released for no reason, that they're only designed to be released when they help us meet a need. Mm. Yeah. And you made some great points in the book too, about how we evolve, right? Like, so you talk about, you know, how we were hunters and gatherers. We were, there was so much more danger out there uh, when we were, when we were, you know, our ancestors, but now it's like a lot of that danger has been removed and now it's all like societal fear or fears where now we're fighting to be the one up. Now we're trying to get the respect. We don't, you know, we don't, I don't know, maybe some people get a lot of dopamine with food, but you don't need to search for food as much as you used to. Like that banana, yeah. is, I know exactly where the banana is at. It's right there. So I don't feel the dopamine anymore because I just, you know, obviously walk out and go get it. But um, I think yeah. understanding that though can help you, right? Yes. Like yes. when you understand yes. that you're yes. feeling anxiety, that cortisol is, you know, dripping in your mind because you're in, let's say, a, a social situation and you feel cortisol is because you want to feel accepted. You want to feel the oxytocin. I yes. Love and and the, so cortisol is nature's warning that your survival is threatened. And when a person, let's say, goes to a party or a meeting at work, you're not consciously thinking your survival is threatened, but cortisol turns on whenever you see something similar to anything that hurt you before. And when you're a child, you start life with cortisol because crying is a child's only tool. So we build this big cortisol system. We've inherited it from animals. We've inherited it from childhood. And so whenever you have a potential bump in the road, your whole cortisol system turns on and the chemical makes it feel like your survival is threatened, even though you're not consciously thinking that in words. That's crazy. Like from yeah. the gate, <laughs> cortisol is just killing us. Um, and well, and then on the other hand, if we know it, then we can take responsibility for our thoughts instead of getting sucked into all these messages that our survival is threatened, which I think are not helpful. So I'm going to ask a really dumb question right now because it's it, it you know the the science shows that the, these are chemicals that we we produce. How do we know that these are the, the chemicals? You know what I mean? Like how do we tell the difference in serotonin, dopamine, and all those? Is it different different um, like brain activity? Like different parts of the brain activate when certain things you know certain chemicals are released? Is that how you guys measure that? Like I don't. It's always sure. fascinating me. Like you're saying, oh, this is, you know, this is dopamine. Like, how do we know it's dopamine? You know, like, I, that's just very, I've always been curious about that. Sure. Um, well, two funny short answers. Um, the, each one is a different molecule. Um, like people who do chemistry know about molecules. And um, the molecule of dopamine there, there's a jewelry company that produces each of them. And you can get, I have earrings and necklace of the dopamine molecule, serotonin molecule, endorphin really? molecule. Yeah. So that's funny. 
Now, there's a book called um, Molecules of Emotion. Mm -hmm. And um, my, my other book, Tame Your Anxiety, gives more of this background too. The whole um, gradual, slow understanding from researchers from 100, 150 years ago of what causes different responses. And there's only a limited amount of experimentation you could do on humans. And even today, monkey research isn't allowed anymore. But historically, um, animal research um, made it clear that when you could go either direction, you know, you can give an animal this chemical and see how it acts, or you could see how it acts and then um, test the blood or the cerebrospinal mm. fluid for the chemical. Mm. Yeah, there was like some, I was reading some book and they had mentioned, um, like they did a, an experiment with a mouse or a rat or something like that where. Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. He, he was like, he, he kept hitting the buzzer or something like that where he kept injecting, like he kept hitting the dopamine spot in his brain and he actually killed himself because he wouldn't eat or anything like, like that. He just kept hitting that, that dopamine. Like, yeah, yeah. So this is in the book. So this is a really old experiment, like half a century or so from the days before all these chemicals were understood, they were just starting to collect this information. And it was then called the pleasure center. So they were not actually focused on the chemicals then. So there are different threads. This is the trouble with academia, which is why I quit. Like the people who study <laughs> one, the people who study one chemical don't study other things. And the people who study one brain region don't talk to the people who study the chemical. Those people don't talk to the monkey people. So it's all separate silos. Mm. But um, back then, what was so amazing, they called it the pleasure center. And they gave this mouse or rat the opportunity to push, um, a, push a lever. And whenever it pushed the lever, it got a stimulation there. And it kept pushing it, which means it felt, <clears throat> excuse me, that people interpreted, wow, it must feel so good. Mm -hmm. And it kept pushing it, but it would not eat, it would not drink, and it would not pursue a sexual opportunity that was presented to it. So then you have to say, well, how could it be a pleasure center? Because how could you define pleasure in a way that made you, you know, so the more modern understanding of this is that it's the expectation of a reward. So it's, I, I guess the one example would be like, you feel like something's about to happen, even if you're in a horror movie or something. And it's like, I can't leave because I feel like something's about to happen. So that was why he couldn't stop himself to do other things because he felt like something really big is mm. about to happen. It's like cell phones, right? Like the, that vibration in your pocket? Yes, but that where that comes from is past experience with good news that came on your cell phone, right? Mm. So when I have a free minute, it's like, what can I do that's going to feel good? And then the last time I got good news on my phone, that made a connection that's like, oh, maybe I'll get good news if I pick up my phone. But we all know that when you pick up your phone, you don't necessarily get good news, but you hope, you know, oh, but maybe I'll get this or that. You know? <laughs> but that's, that's like, that's the creation of neural pathways, right? Like in your yeah. mind where new experiences create new neural pathways, which isn't always easy, right? Because it always wants the neural path, uh, the electricity in your, in your brain wants to go down pathways that's already created because it's, you know, the path of least resistance where, you know, you give actual suggestions in here of things that you can do that can create new neural pathways. Um, can you give a, a, like, just really quick, like a quick, you know, uh, list of, of things and activities that you can oh. do to create new neural pathways? Sure. Well, first, um, what I talk a lot about is that the big, well-developed pathways in your brain are built when you're young because that's when our neuroplasticity is high for reasons mm -hmm. I explain. So in adulthood, to create a new neural pathway that's big enough to sort of compete with the super highways you already have, you have to repeat it a lot. So I don't give like a list of what you should do, but to help you have a strategy to say, 
what can I do that's going to feel good that I'm willing to repeat a lot? Because that's the thing. A lot of people are not willing to repeat it a lot to build up that pathway. So part of it is creating the strategy to reward yourself to do the new thing. And then to say, what new thing am I willing to invest all of that effort in? And then to say, what new dopamine thing? What new serotonin thing? What new oxytocin thing? Yeah, it's like 45 days, right? Like you have to do something like for that long to create a new neural pathway. Um, But I like how your book, you know, you have exercises, like you have things that you can be very interactive with in here and write down and keep it with you and like interact. So that way you can, you can really, really absorb the content, Um, which I love. I mean, this has been a great, you know, this is just a great basic book about happiness, about what the chemicals that are related to the way that you feel like the cortisol was a big thing for me. Like, um, you know, the drip, drip, drip of anxiety as opposed to the flooding of cortisol, which is depression. Right. Um, but all of that stuff, like you said, is very basic in nature where it's telling you, it's like, you know, back in the day you would feel anxiety. It would, you know, because you, it was trying to, you know, your brain was trying to save your life from danger. So like kind of understanding that a little bit more. Exactly. It really helped me. So like when I'm in social situations and I start feeling anxious, like I, I can just kind of step back and say, well, what do you do? Like, you know, this is, this is because cortisol is in your system right now because of, you know, um, you trying to fit into the group because obviously back in the day, if you weren't a part of the group, that meant death, right? Like you, they would exactly. exile you and you would exactly. you know likely not survive. And or even laugh at you. Or laugh, yeah. <laughs> Which, I'm, I'm so sure this you've is, seen that. <laughs> well, and so the amazing thing is when you're a teenager is when you're having peak neuroplasticity. If someone else laughs at you when you're a teenager, it's not just the oxytocin cortisol of do I belong or don't I belong, but respect, the one up, the one down, which is serotonin. And so you, when you lose on both of those, that's stressful. But the, the complication is that the, you, you reactivate it yourself because these chemicals create such big pathways. And in the animal world, when an animal in adolescence fails to get the one down position, it really is a survival threat because they cannot get mating opportunity until they're like a big gorilla, let's say. So it's so, that's why we, we make life or death feelings out of these super small little minute details. Mm-hmm. Well, how do you deal with like anxiety when you feel it? You know, can you, can you realize that it's, do you kind of recognize it as cortisol? Sure. So um, many, many different strategies. You could say that, I guess I realized that I had a lot of loops creating it when I was young. So I needed to create a lot of new circuits to, to undo it. So first, um, I grew up around a tremendous amount of anxiety because my mother was very anxious. And my mother, not only did she feel like other people were being harsh with her, but then she cried on my shoulder, so, which is not really so cool. If parents are listening, do not share your pain with your child. Mm. <laughs> not, not good for them. Uh, so, and my mother did have some very bad experiences in her childhood. So I, I understand how she got wired. But, you know, when I was a kid, so that taught me the anxiety thing. So... I have all these circuits, but then like, let's say I'm at work and I feel uncomfortable around someone. The the cortisol is happening right now. So it's so hard to believe that you're releasing it because of something that happened long ago. So the first step is to see the parallel between what happened to me when I was young and what's happening now so that I can really distance myself from that idea that this other person is trying to get me or this person is looking down on me or that my future survival depends on how this interaction goes. And so that was one, you know, whole avenue. Then another one is um, fear of bothering people was a big one for me because like, because my mother was quite troubled. Like if I 
expressed myself in any way, she might explode just because she was so close to exploding all the time. Mm -hmm. So it always felt like my fault. And she'd tell me it was my fault that she exploded. So we often go around with this idea that if I express myself in any way, other people might explode and then it's going to be my fault. Mm -hmm. So that took, that was another whole circuit. So how can I rewire that? What's an alternative plan? So one therapist taught me when you have something to say, instead of thinking that you're annoying a person, imagine that what you have to say is a brownie and you're offering them a brownie. So that's just one example of like a, an exercise. But then you'd have to do it a lot because the first time you do it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't sure. feel real. It feels stupid. Another exercise I did was when I would check out at the supermarket to make sure to make eye contact with the person because I, you know, you're busy, you're looking in your wallet, whatever. And sometimes I'd make eye contact with them and they wouldn't make eye contact back with me. And I realized that I got really triggered. Mm -hmm. and, and that was because I was ignored when I was young. So it's really, and then I had to, if I kept making eye contact with them each time, and then I instantly was like, oh, they're busy. They're not looking at me because they're doing their job. And also because they're not looking at me because they think I'm not gonna look at them. Why should they, you know? So just when you realize it's, it's just old loops that we're all dealing with, mm -hmm. it just lowers the, the stress level. Mm, that's a lot of good stuff in there. I want to talk and unpack it. Um, so going back to when you were saying, like, you, if you're a parent, you shouldn't kind of unload on your, on your kid, <laughs> right? Like, why is that? Just, just because I'm curious, sure. like, you know what I mean? I'm a, I'm a young sure. parent and I, I feel like, I don't, I don't know. I don't, uh, I don't definitely don't unload my emotions on them. Maybe frustration, but not like emotion. Can you like explain that a little bit more? Like, sure. Maybe so in your a couple experience. of things. One is what's called mirror neurons. So um, what's amazing that I learned about monkeys that I couldn't believe is that little monkeys never get fed except for mother's milk. They have to find their own food and yet all monkeys figure it out. So we're equipped with mirror neurons that motivate us to mirror what others are doing. So if a monkey sees another monkey get food and they like the other monkeys like, wow, I found something good. Or if a monkey, another monkey gets bitten, it's like, wow, I got something bad. So our children have mirror neurons and they are always picking up our good feelings and bad feelings. And do you want them to go through life with your frustrations? No, you know? not at all. You're exactly yeah. right. So, so that's the thing. So that's one part of it. Another part of it is um, there's something I explain in the book called myelin, which is like when you see wires that have a plastic coating on them. Mm -hmm. So we are born with raw wires and children have the capacity to coat their neural pathways with a coating that makes the wire super efficient, just like plastic coated wires. And when you're an adult, the wiring you rely on is the wiring that you myelinated when you were young. That's why we all repeat ourselves. That's why we can all speak our languages that we learned when we were young easily, but when you try to new, learn a new language, it's hard because the neural pathways you build when you were young, they're so well developed that they just feel true and right. And so the emotional responses that a kid learns, that's where they're going to go the rest of their life. That's so interesting. Yeah. Like, that's so interesting. Um, what did, all right, so what did you get your PhD in uh, as far as psych, like psychology? Like what, what's yeah, specialization? Um, so, no, um, I got my PhD. I started my graduate work in the 1970s, mm -hmm. uh, finished my PhD in the early 80s, and it was in international management. So I have followed psychology over mm. the years through many trends, and so many trends have come and gone. And... I, that was not my original field. Um, I went to a school for international relations 
and I studied a lot of different cultures over the years. And that's one of the things that cued me into the idea that every culture has the same stuff going on. And every culture, they, they think, oh, this is our culture and that's your culture. But it's all the same stuff. Sure. We're all human beings, right? We all have the same chemicals, right? Yep. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, psychology has fascinated you. So like you really yeah. studied it. Like what, like who is, his, who has impacted you the most in, in, in your studies? Oh, I have this great story. So there's this guy called Albert Ellis. He's not quite as famous today because he was not in academia at all. Albert Ellis, most people have heard of cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, but he started it, but in the beginning he called it rational emotive therapy. But it's, it's basically CBT. So Albert Ellis, E-L-L-I-S. And what he's famous for is um, he had social anxiety. So he forced himself to ask 100 girls on a date. What? And he got, he got, he got um, booted 100 times out of 100, I think. <laughs> and he writes this in his autobiography. It's very funny. But what made it so pivotal in my life is he had a Friday night open house and anybody could volunteer, ask their question, and you would be the guinea pig and you would sit, sit in the front of the room and he would work you in public. And I went to many of these sessions and I volunteered to be the guinea pig twice. And this is when I was very young and I was um, not so inclined to spend money on therapy and maybe I was, mm -hmm. I was so mm -hmm. anxious, like I was afraid to even open up. And then seeing this going on in public was so valuable for me. What do you mean by working in the public? Like, what was he doing? Oh, I still have the tapes. Um, he could be a little crude. Um, he would help you. Um, I'm trying to think of what today's terminology um, um, Dan, Daniel, what's his name? Uh, Daniel Amon calls them ANTS, A-N-T-S, which means automatic negative thoughts, your ANTS. Um, so each generation of psychology has its own terminology, but it's the, the automatic thoughts that come to you, but you'd say, oh, I'm not really thinking that, but you really are, like all the time. <laughs> so first, to the courage to admit to yourself that you're thinking that, and then the courage to admit it in public, and then the courage to actually try to replace it with an alternative thought by attack. He would have you attack it. Like he was very aggressive about that. And he would have you challenge it, which CBT does. CBT mm -hmm. therapists, um, don't thank you, CBT therapists. So they have you challenge it in a rational way I didn't love this because that's um, sort of putting yourself down. And so my work is based on more self-acceptance. So what did he make you do? Like the twice that you're in there, like what did he do? Um, trying to remember. Now you're making me think I should get that old um, uh, tape and have what, like audio cassette. You should. You and should. Have it, have it digitized. You oh, should have it digitized. Yeah. Are you kidding me? That's and some I'll great send it stuff. To you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I had a big fear of rejection when I was young and um, real terror of rejection. And I was quite, you know, um, neglected when I was young. And so I had like a really infantile terror of rejection, which I think is also quite common. Um, uh, so when he would try to tell me that I was creating that fear of rejection rather than that other people were actually rejecting me. So mm. I, that was very hurtful to me, sure. but I needed to go through that. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people feel like that, right? Like they don't want to, yeah. they don't start a project because they, they're the fear of rejection. Like, I mean, it was hard for me yeah. to start the podcast because it was like, you know, people are going to look at me, you know, yeah. my cortisol was drip, 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 drip. People, you yes. know, people are not yes. going to like it. You're yes. going to go against yes. the grain. You know, one thing that helped me, if you start a project and other people say this, this, and this, and I realized other people will criticize you, but they all have different criticisms, mm -hmm. which shows that they don't know better. 
<laughs> because they're all, and then when you hear their criticism, you say, what was going on for them when they were a teenager? And when you hear their story, it's like they're just repeating their old story. Yeah. So you have to really not rely too much on others. And one thing I have to tell you, the funniest thing, the founder of Netflix, he just wrote a book called That Will Never Work. Because when he started Netflix, everyone said to him, that will never work. <laughs> well, it's like Airbnb, right? Yeah. Like yeah. they, they, that was that whole concept. Like they, they were like, you are unethical if you start this company. Nobody's going to ever yeah. rent somebody else's house while they're in there. And look at them yeah. now. I mean, yeah. It's, it's and you know insane. what? I, I said that too. And then after a little while, because I have kids in my thirties, after a little while, I started doing it. And then all my, you know, people my age, they, they all poo pooed me. But so that's why I'm, <laughs> I'm not a good herd follower. So I'm very much um, herd follower. So you're a loner. So you're, you're not worried about the, the, ser what is it? The oxytocin? Well, so here's the thing. I know that we need it. So I find alternative ways to get it. Okay. And the alternative way, um, here's the thing. Animals need a herd, but instead of romanticizing a herd, excuse me, the reality is that they are actually running to a herd when a predator comes because then they reduce their own chances of getting eaten by hiding behind someone else who might get eaten. So let's not romanticize a herd. Let's just say that it's a natural impulse to feel safe. So how can I have a herd to feel safe? And so instead of having any one person that I follow all the time or any group that I follow all the time, I take it moment by moment. Like if I'm feeling unsafe in a moment, I say, who do I know whose opinion I would trust about this one particular issue? And then what three people could I ask so that I don't like get oversensitive mm -hmm. to any one person? Sure. I love it. Uh, there's a there's a part in your book. It's 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 in the chapter of your action plan that I highlighted and underlined um, because it's, it's very important. Uh, I think it's talking about good decisions and bad decisions, uh, and, and basically, you can accept the fact that you will always have ups and downs because your brain is designed to continually seek rewards and avoid pain. So, just understanding that. Like your brain wants to feel good all the time. It wants to run away from pain. So like to realize that, I think it, people, it will help people realize where they're at in their lives and, and why they feel a certain way and probably cope better with some of the situations they're in because it's, you know, once they turn that brain in on itself and realize and like kind of awaken to the situation and awaken to some of the basics that you explain in your book, I think it can really, you know, make them feel better, right? Like I think that Exactly. A person can start feeling better immediately just to say, nothing is wrong with me. My happy chemicals are not meant to be on all the time. And other people are not getting them all the time. And one other thing, I think a lot of traditions are trying to sell you on the idea of chasing ecstasy. But mm -hmm. my view is any ecstasy that you get, you're sort of stealing it from tomorrow's budget, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you're not really helping yourself. That's awesome. Loretta, how can people get a hold of you? How can they, how can they reach out or how can they find more out, more out about your books and, and your content? Thank you. Uh, everything's on my website, innermammalinstitute.org, innermammalinstitute.org. And I have videos that um, explain this all like in a half hour. And I have a five day free happy chemical jumpstart that explains this all in five free emails. And I have lots of fun resources that you can show to young people and um, a lot of it's free. And then I have a number of books. Awesome. Loretta, last question, kind of a big one, kind of important. Don't want to put you on the spot, um, but it's uh, something that I love listening to. What do you want your legacy to be? Oh, thank you. Well, um, this is very clear. The Inner Mammal Institute is what I want my legacy to be. So it's a website with, um, has, um, we're having now a weekly Zoom chat. We have um, a um, training program. We have a Facebook discussion group, a YouTube channel, and I invite everyone. Also, there's a contact form on my website if it's something mm -hmm. urgent. And um, 
I hope in the future that this message will reach everyone because everybody needs it. Absolutely. Everybody, everybody needs to realize the habits of a happy brain. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Loretta. This has been amazing. Great. Thank you for having me and for reading. <laughs> Bye-bye. I want to say thank you to Dr. Loretta Bruning for joining the show and hanging out. I want to say thank you to you, the listener, for downloading this episode and, and taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to listen and gain more value, gain more education on habits that can make you happy. <sighs> Man, it's been amazing. So go to yoursuperiorself.com. Let me know how you guys are doing. Leave me a message. Go follow me on social media. Instagram at tdowns80 and on Twitter at Downs Trey. I love hearing from you guys. Like your stories are amazing. Keep it up. Keep crushing every day. Going out there and just striving to be better than you were yesterday. All right, guys. I'll talk to you later. <laughs>